Hey, it's Cole from E3. I want to thank you for listening to this message. I pray that as you listen, that you would be blessed by this message and that in the right way that God would challenge you in your walk with Jesus. So enjoy the message. Well, I'm Pastor Steve, also one of the pastors here at Genesee. And in a moment, I'm going to introduce the sermon series that is going to be our focus for the next seven weeks. But first, I want to share a little bit about the inspiration for this series. Now, many of you in the room were here on Good Friday. And for the benefit of those who weren't, we did a little exercise um, as a part of an attempt to help us to get a sense of the reality of our sin. The great burden that we've been set free from, we encourage you to go and write down a sin. But not just any sin, what often theologians call a besetting sin. That's a fancy way of saying that sin that you keep promising God, I'll never do it again. And then you do again and again and again. It's that persistent sin problem. So people wrote down words and obviously there were no names on the slips of paper. And then we encourage them to go over to either that lit cross or the one on the other side of the room and to go and tape to the cross of Jesus those sins as a means of being reminded that our sins are forgiven by Jesus, that they are covered by his blood. And it was a beautiful thing to see so many people who came forward that day. Well, after that Good Friday service, we actually left those up. And on Sunday, people came in, and once again, we had that powerful reminder. And your experience ended at that point. However, we didn't just discard those notes. We first took them down, and Ron and Cole tabulated them and came up with some statistics on what are the besetting sins that our congregation is most struggling with. The words up there on the screen match your responses. The size of the fonts indicates how often that particular word was mentioned. Now, do any of you remember the TV show Family Feud? Okay, you know it's not off the air. It is going into its 50th season this coming year. Family Feud always began with a statement and then a question. Now, imagine for a moment that I'm host Richard Dawson. Or if you have a really strong imagination, imagine that I'm Steve Harvey. As I say, we surveyed the congregation of Geneseo E Free Church, asking them the following question. We put the top seven answers on the board. Here's the question we asked. What sin do you need to be set free from? Combining synonyms and related concepts, here's what we found. The number one sin burden that we are shouldering is anxiety and worry. 21 people cited this struggle. Then fear garnered 20 responses. The third highest was pride with 19 votes. Shame and guilt put together had 18 mentions. Lust, pornography, and unclean thoughts were nailed to the cross 15 times. Anger 14 and lies 10. Although not necessarily taken in this order, these are the topics that we are going to be studying for the next seven weeks. Now, we talked about it as a preaching team, and we could have chosen to simply address these topics like a series on seven deadly sins. But I wanted this series to be positive and practical. We know that we're struggling with these sins. This is our list, after all. What we need is hope, and what we need is an action plan. And that led to the series title, Set Free. Now, I suspect that very few of you can read the small letters on the screen, but let me read them because they're essential. They come from Jesus' words in John 8, 38. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Amen? Amen. When Jesus sets you free, you are free indeed. Jesus cancels our sin and sets us free from even the most entrenched sins in my life. That is the only cancel culture I like. Jesus creates a culture of canceling sin and then brings those people together into this glorious body called his church. Now this week we're going to look at the third highest vote-getter, pride. 
Now, why treat this one first? Simple chronology. Pride is the very first sin. And we're going to see that in a few minutes. Also, although pride was not the top vote-getter, I think it probably should have been. You see, we don't easily admit to our pride, do we? But there is one thing that I can guarantee you. You have a pride problem out there. I have a pride problem up here. We all are struggling with pride. And since it is so entrenched in all of our lives, addressing pride and learning how to be set free of it holds the promise of revolutionizing our walk with God, but also the promise of bringing delight to the heart of God. Because there is no sin that God wants more to set us free from than this heavy burden, this sin of pride. So we're going to look at three key insights on how to be set free of pride. And the first is that in order to be set free from pride, we need to know its origins. So turn with me to Isaiah 14, verses 12 through 15. I'll give you a moment to get there. How you were fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. How you were cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to Sheol, to the far reaches of the pit. Now, these words are part of a taunt song. How many of you knew that that's a genre of music, taunt songs? Not too many. But I know that you know these songs. For example, when Carly Simon sings, You're so vain, you probably think this song is about you. Taunt song. In fact, it's been a debate for years, and she's never quite revealed who she was singing about. But I know who thought he was being sung about her ex-husband, James Taylor, because months later he released a song, Oh Woman, Don't You Loose Your Lip On Me. (laughs) That's a taunt song. Now, I have been accused in recent months of often making references to old TV shows and old songs. I kind of have the old guy playbook. So for the benefit of the young folks here today, let me give you another example of a taunt song. Any song that Taylor Swift sings about her ex-boyfriends, taunt songs. So we know this genre, we've heard these songs. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Isaiah encourages the Israelites, soon to be exiled to Babylon, to remember that God would deliver them and that they would someday sing a taunt song to the proud king of Babylon once they were set free. However, very early on, students of God's Word began to realize that there was more going on in this text. Look more closely at those five I will statements in Isaiah 14. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds and I will be like the Most High. Both ancient and modern readers have understood that there is very powerful language in this text. God refers to angels as his stars. It's probably referring to celestial bodies, maybe because they were his star players. But the setting is clearly in heaven, and the rebel is somebody who seeks to be God. I believe that these are the five I wills of Satan. You see, the devil was not content with his exalted position in heaven as the day star or the shining one, the translation of the word that we know as Lucifer. He didn't want to serve the throne. The devil wanted to sit on the throne and rule over all of it. Now, if this sounds like a bit of a stretch, like I'm pulling this a bit out of context, let me share a snippet from another taunt song. 
In Ezekiel 28, there's a taunt song against the king of Tyre. And it begins in verses 12 through 13 with these words. You were the signet of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. Now clearly, this is talking about more than the king of Tyre. There's actually a very short list of people who were ever in the Garden of Eden. There is God. We know that. He walked in the garden in the cool of the day. There is Adam. There is Eve. There is the serpent or the devil. And then there's the one we often forget about. After they were kicked out of Eden, God went and appointed an angel with a whirling sword to prevent Adam and Eve from coming back and eating of the tree of life. End of list. Those are the people who were in Eden. Now the description continues in verse 14. You were, anoint, you were an anointed guardian cherub. I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of God. In the midst of the stones of fire you walked. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till unrighteousness was found in you. In the abundance of your trade, you were filled with violence in your midst, and you sinned. So I cast you as a profane thing from the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O guardian cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. Now notice the key descriptive terms here. This created one cast down was a guardian cherub on the mountain of God. Well, we know that cherubs refer to angels. The stones of fire, another poetic reference to angels. You see, these two taunt songs refer in part to proud heathen kings, one from Babylon, one from Tyre. But they also tell a more significant origin story. This is the origin story of sin. And it is the story of the first sinner, Lucifer, who was referred to as Satan. He was proud of his beauty. His aspirations were filled with overweening pride. You see the pride in I will, I will, I will, five times. He was so proud that he actually thought he could supplant God and seize the throne of heaven for himself. Pride is the first sin. And in many ways, it is arguably the worst sin because it stirs up two things in our hearts, rebellion and ingratitude. And these are the most fertile soil for every other imaginable sin. Now, I'd like to share a second insight. In order to be set free from pride, we need to know its effects. I want you for a moment to think of a child blowing up a balloon. Now, there are typically two things that a young child does when blowing up a balloon. The first thing is to get it pretty big, and then the anticipation hits in, and they can wait no longer, and they go and open their fingers and watch it fly into the air. That's one thing they do, but it's not the only thing. The other thing a child does with a balloon is they start blowing, and they keep blowing. And blowing, and blowing, and blowing, and blowing. And all of a sudden you look at the balloon and all it's turning whitish. And then they keep on blowing and it bursts. That is what pride is like. That's a beautiful picture. Pride builds, then it bloats, then it blows things up. It blows up relationships. Pride blows up peace and tranquility between nations, within families. It blows up trust. It blows up legacies. It blows up reputations. It is destructive and it is particularly self-destructive. Proverbs 16, 18 through 19 underscores the far-reaching impact of pride. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. It is better to be of a lowly spirit with the poor than to divide the spoil with the proud. Now these verses are often summarized with an aphorism, pride precedes the fall. And there are many examples on the pages of the Bible of people whose pride literally led to their downfall. 
And some of the most dramatic examples are those of kings or their right-hand officials. Because when you add pride and power together, they create a fire that is white hot within our souls. So I'd like to share two examples from the pages of the Old Testament. The first is the story of King Uzziah. By and large, Uzziah, who also is given the name Azariah, was a good king. And he could have been one of Israel's greatest kings, but he left many wins on the table because of his pride. His story is recorded in 2 Chronicles. Turn with me to 2 Chronicles 26, 16 through 21. But when he was strong, he grew proud to his destruction, for he was unfaithful to the Lord his God. And he entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. But Azariah the priest went in after him with 80 priests of the Lord who were men of valor. And they withstood King Uzziah and said to him, It is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. Go out of the sanctuary, for you have done wrong, and it will bring you no honor from the Lord God. Then Uzziah was angry. He had a censer in his hand to burn incense, and when he became angry with the priests, leprosy broke out on his forehead. In the presence of the priests in the house of the Lord, by the altar of incense. And Azariah the chief priest and all the priests looked at him, and behold, he was leprous in his forehead. And they rushed him out quickly, and he himself hurried to go out, because the Lord had struck him. And King Uzziah was a leper to the day of his death, and being a leper lived in a separate house, for he was excluded from the house of the Lord. And Jotham his son was over the king's household, governing the people of the land. Now, I don't have time to dig into each of these verses because they're here for the purpose of illustration and application. So let me share four brief lessons that we can take from this sad tale. The first lesson is that our strengths can be the seeds of our destruction. Look at verse 16 again. But when he was strong, he grew proud to his destruction. Now, Uzziah became king at 16 years of age. His father was a mostly righteous king, and he served together with his father as a co-regent for the first 24 years of his 52-year reign. During the time of Zechariah the prophet, he was under godly influence, and he became one of the most powerful of the southern kingdom of Judah's kings. He was a military innovator. He was a very capable administrator. He was good at the job of being king. Except for King Jehoshaphat, he was the strongest king in Judah since Solomon. But we see that his strength led to pride. And I just want to share this just as a cautionary word. If you're in a successful season in your life, if your business is booming, your family is thriving, your hobbies are thrilling, be on the lookout. Be on the lookout for pride. Because pride is a piranha. It can strip you bare and quickly at that. A second lesson we can learn from Uzziah. We also learn from King Uzziah that overstepping our authority is an act of unfaithfulness to God. Knowing how power can feed pride, God intentionally created some very sharp lines of distinction some boundaries between three key offices, the prophet, the priest, and the king. There are a few, like, like um, Samuel, who held two of those. He was both a prophet and a priest. But only Jesus held all three. And by and large, those were exceptions. The rule was that no man would hold more than one of those offices. But Uzziah had already done the king thing. He had proven himself. He was successful. He was looking for a new challenge, desiring something more. So he grabbed a censer, the thing that you burn incense in, and he went into the temple, and he decided that he would now perform the duties of a priest. I mean, what's so bad here? What could be wrong with worshiping God? 
Doesn't the king need to set the best religious example? But this wasn't religious zeal. It wasn't motivated by the call of God. This was pride, and it did not achieve the result Uzziah thought it would. You know, over my years in ministry, I have seen again and again how people who have been given great spiritual gifts from God ignore those gifts, even look down upon those gifts, and desire to have the gifts that were given to another. I've seen it so many times. I've seen people gifted in teaching children who insist on teaching adults. I have seen people who are gifted in helping and serving and coming alongside of people who then insist that they're going to be a worship leader, even if there's the small problem that they can't carry a note in a box. But I've seen this with my own eyes. Here is Uzziah. He is the king of a nation that is now becoming once again a powerful nation. And it wasn't enough for him. Third lesson we can learn from Uzziah. He teaches us that spurning correction is a doubling down on sin. And when we double down on sin, we get double trouble. Now, I can't think of anyone on the pages of the Bible who had a better opportunity to turn away from his sin. Often when a leader is going in a sinful direction, God raises up a prophet. But look at what happens here. God raises up a high priest and 80 righteous priests, and all of them confront Uzziah. These men, these 80 priests, they are referred to as Eshachayil. And that means that more than just men of integrity, integrity, courage, substance, everything that creates a person of value. Remember that woman in Proverbs 31? Eshachayil. She too was a person of that kind of broad integrity. And despite this opportunity, there was no dissuading Uzziah. One of the greatest sins of pride in our lives is unteachability. So ask yourself this hard question. How do you react when lovingly confronted? Do you deliberate? Do you ponder? Do you reflect? Do you consider the words that were spoken to you carefully? Or do you go on the attack and double down? There's another lesson, though, that we can learn from King Uzziah. Spiritual pride is still pride, and it is sin. Many of the kings of Judah and Israel were debauched adulterers. Several of them were murderers. Some even sacrificed their own children to pagan gods. Uzziah's offense seems small in comparison. He just wanted a larger role in God's house. However, in God's eyes, Uzziah's pride was not a little thing. It was a big deal, even if it was spiritually motivated. It may be hard to fathom, but your ministry, your point of Christian service can build pride in your life. Now, let me go on the record. I am incredibly proud of this church. Of the three churches that I have served, this has not only been my favorite, but it has been the one that I have had the greatest pride in. And I am incredibly proud of this congregation. You exceed my every expectation time and time again. That's not a bad thing, but it can become a bad thing. See, I need to guard my heart carefully. I need to guard my heart against taking credit for our successes. I need to guard my heart lest I fall into a pattern of dismissing every challenge and blaming someone else. You see, this is God's house. And we pastors have a bad habit. And this is especially true of senior pastors. We gather together and we'll talk about, hey, how are things going in your church, Mark? Hey, have you heard what's going on in John's church? It's pretty spectacular. This is not Steve Palm's church. These men like Ryan and Pastor Ryan, Pastor Cole, Catherine, Ron, they are not my staff. It all belongs to Jesus. And I need to continually remind myself of that, that it's all his. 
Let's look at one more bad, uh, bad example, a man whose pride also led to his downfall. Now his name is Haman the Agagite. He was descended from the Canaanite tribes, which means that he had a lifelong hatred of the Jewish people, and he is now serving a Persian king, Xerxes, who is called Ahasuerus in the Bible. King Xerxes is a powerful king, but he's also a drunk. He deposed one of his queens for not being willing to dance seductively before his drunken guests. And then he called for a beauty contest to replace her, and Esther was chosen, a Jewish woman whose identity was not yet known even to Xerxes and his court. But she wins the contest, and she's given the title Queen Esther, even though she couldn't be a reigning queen because she was not of the Persian nobility, and that went against the law of the Medes and Persians, they cannot change. Now, we have preached through this entire book before, and I don't have time to read all the text, but let me retell the story briefly, and you can follow in your Bibles if you look at those bullets. The story of Haman's downfall begins with his pride that caused him to easily take offense. Esther had an older cousin of her father's generation named Mordecai. Her parents are gone, and he seems to serve as a parent figure in her life. When King Xerxes promoted Haman and placed him above all of the other officials, all of those officials bowed down to Haman, except for one of the officials, Mordecai. Now Haman learns that Mordecai is a Jew, and he has it out for his people. This harbored hurt motivates Haman to set a trap. He appeals to King Xerxes' paranoia, and he says, there is a group, there is a people group within your kingdom, and they are different from us, and they are dismissive of Persia's laws. And Haman offers to contribute a veritable fortune to the king's treasuries in exchange for the honor of exterminating these menaces. Now in chapter 5, Haman refines his plan. He cannot enjoy his wealth as long as the man who refused to bow before him walks the earth. So he conspires with his wife and some friends. And he erects a large stake on his property. Now it's called gallows in many of our translations, but the Hebrew word actually suggests not something that you're hung from, but a spike that you're impaled on. Then there's an unanticipated turnabout that takes place in chapter 6. And I'm going to read verses 6 through 9 because of the dramatic element. So Haman came in, and the king said to him, What should be done to the man whom the king delights to honor? And Haman said to himself, Whom would the king delight to honor more than me? And Haman said to the king, For the man whom the king delights to honor... Let royal robes be brought, which the king has worn, and the horse that the king has ridden, and on whose head a royal crown is set. And let the robes and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials. Let them dress the man whom the king delights to honor, and let them lead him on the horse through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Haman is so full of himself that he can't imagine in a million years that the king was thinking of someone else. But he didn't know what he didn't know. The previous night, the king couldn't sleep. And he did something that I know we often do. After you've taken the sleep aids and they haven't helped, you reach for a thick, fat book, something that seems boring. Well, that's exactly what the king does. He chose to read from the historical records of his earlier reign, but he stumbled upon an exciting tale. He learned as he read a story that there was a man who foiled a plot by two of the king's guards who were plotting to assassinate him. And that man had never been rewarded. And his name was Mordecai. Now Haman's plan delighted the king. And he ordered Haman to parade Mordecai on horseback and to sing his praises out loud. 
A deeper injury to Haman's pride can hardly be imagined. Next, we see an anticipated endgame. Haman's scheming wife, Zeresh, and their friends see the writing on the wall. Haman tells his wife and friends how his beautiful plan blew up in his face. And in the second part of verse of Esther 6.13, we read, Then the wise men and his wife Zeresh said to him, If Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of the Jewish people, you will not overcome him, but he will sh- but you will surely fall before him. Now, the final straw features more drunken behavior. Esther throws a banquet in the palace garden. Xerxes is drinking way too much wine. Haman is outright drunk. He knows that the king has determined his fate. Now, Xerxes steps outside probably to get some air, and Haman seizes the opportunity to plead with Esther. But in his drunken state, he falls on the couch. He's sprawled out next to Esther, and the king walks in, and he is enraged. And just at that moment, let me pause. There are never coincidences when God is involved. And just that moment, a eunuch walks in and tells King Xerxes about the giant spike that Haman had erected to impale Mordecai upon. Xerxes orders that Haman be impaled and Mordecai be exalted. This is one of the most harrowing tales of pride preceding a fall. But let's pause and consider four lessons that we can learn from Haman's pride. Number one, pride causes us to harbor hurts and it fuels hatred and rage. And I'm just going to ask one simple hard question. Is there someone in your family who you won't talk to? Is it possible, just possible, that the real problem is not what they did to you, but the fact that you're still holding on to the hurt? Jesus calls us to be forgivers, to release the offender, and nurturing our hearts or hurts just fuels our rage. Number two, pride leads to exaggerated responses. Mordecai refused to bow to Haman. He he doubtless saw the evil in the heart of this man. How does Haman respond? He plans a genocide. He plans to destroy all the Jewish people. Now, I have a saying that I coined many years ago, and you've probably heard me say it before. When you throw a penny into a lake and a tidal wave comes back at you, the cause was not the penny. The longer you harbor hurt, And the longer that you fuel your pain with pride, the crazier you will become. Did you follow the story of that gamer last week? How many of you followed the story of Edward Kang? Anybody? He was playing a Korean role-play game, a game called Arc Age. And an opponent did what Kang called something bad. He never elaborated, he just said he did something bad in the game. So he told his parents that he was going to see an online friend. He traveled from New Jersey to Florida, broke into the other gamer's home, and hit him over the head repeatedly with a hammer. Fortunately, the man being struck over the head wrestled him to the ground, and then his parents jumped in, and and Kang was arrested. That's what I mean by exaggerated responses. Number three, others often see the fall long before we do. You see, it's difficult to see the pride in our lives. In fact, as a learning tool, I've printed a paper describing 50 fruits of pride. It's intended to be a bit of a, of a self-test, an assessment You put a check next to each sentence or statement that applies to you. There are copies by all of the doors, and I encourage you, if you didn't pick one on the way in, on your way out, pick out a copy. And let me tell you personally, it was of value to go through that little assessment. Haman didn't see his fall coming, but his wife and his friends saw it clearly. Your pride could be leading you to the edge of a cliff. Yet you are convinced all the while that you're about to fall off 
You're convinced that your marriage is great. You might be teetering on the edge of divorce. You may have lost your wife or your husband's heart, but you're convinced my marriage is great. My kids are happy. You might not know the quarter of what they're up to, but my kids are happy. My boss loves me. You have no idea you're on the ax list. So let me ask you this question. Do you have an accountability partner? Have you opened yourself up, given people permission to speak into your life? Are you open to well-intentioned criticism? You see, others can see your flaws and your coming falls before you will ever see it, and they can help pull you back from the edge. Now, the fourth lesson that we can learn from Haman, Haman is a sobering one. Haman is not the only person to hang on his own gallows. Are you plotting revenge against someone? Now, you might be sitting there saying, well, pastor, what do you think we are, a bunch of axe murderers? No. Are you hoping that somebody will fail? Are you actually excited about the prospect of seeing somebody in your life taken down a few notches? That is the desire for revenge. Your pride can blind you to the real spiritual danger of this. But not only is there spiritual danger, many such plans, both small and great, blow up in our faces. So we've seen the origin of pride. It is the first sin, and it comes from no less than Satan himself. And we've seen two glaring examples of how pride precedes the fall. But very briefly, there's one more remaining lesson. In order to be set free from pride, we need to know its cure. Now, some maladies have a simple cure. You can actually just take some pill and the problem is gone. And then there are those that have a very simple treatment plan. A few months ago, I went to see my eye doctor. Maybe it's now close to uh, a year ago. And he measured my intraocular pressure. You know that thing that used to be a puff of air in your eyeballs that made you wince? And I've always had a good result on that. And he told me, your pressure is high. You have glaucoma. And then they went and they did those scans. And they showed pictures of the optic nerves. And the doctor said, but I've got great news for you. There's no thinning of your optic nerves. And this is not a big problem. Here's a sample bottle of drops. Here's a prescription for more of them. Put one drop in each eye every evening before you go to bed. That's it. It's all good. Don't you wish that every medical condition was like that? A drop in both eyes and you're all good? But when it comes to sin sickness, the cure is never one and done. There's no drop that will cure your pride. But here's the good news. There is an effective treatment plan. But pride has to be combated on several fronts. It is not curable this side of eternity, but it is treatable, and here's a treatment plan on how to get pride into remission. Number one, have an accurate view of yourself. Paul addresses the importance of this right view of ourselves in Romans 12, verse 3. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. You see, some of the poop psychology of today tells us that we are the best thing since life spread, that the purpose of your life is self-actualization, to become the best you that you can become. But God has a different plan for us. He calls us to have an accurate view. There's no good name for this, but rather than self-esteem, think biblical esteem. Seeing yourself the way the Bible describes you. We are sinners with desperately wicked hearts. And we are God's beloved children, heirs of Christ. And between those broadly set channel markers, we can find our proper place in this world. Number two, have the humble attitude of Christ. All Christian Bible believers have their favorite Bible passage. Mine is Philippians 2, 1 through 11. In fact, I even received a mug as a gift from someone in my small group, 
And it had that Bible passage on it, and on the other side it said, Pastor. I love that mug. You know what? It's good to call out good deeds in public. Michelle, thank you. That is an awesome mug. Cindy got one with her favorite Bible passage, and her name, Pastor's Wife, is on the other side. But let me just share verses 5 through 8 from my favorite passage. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. I came across an amazing quote this week that sharply draws the contrast between Satan's pride and Jesus' humility. Zach Poonin said, Sin came through the pride of Lucifer and salvation through the humility of Jesus. Amen? Amen. The Son of God came into this world. He was humbly born, laid in a feeding trough, as a newborn infant, raised in a rough and tumble town called Nazareth, one of his own disciples at the time he was being called said, Nazareth, what good can come from Nazareth? He lived a life of sinless purity, perfection, and he was nailed to a cross for you. And that's what it means he emptied himself. It means that he came to serve men by becoming a man and that he came to redeem men and women by shedding his own blood for them. If you and I embrace Jesus' example, if we model our lives after his servant's heart, there is precious little remaining room in our hearts for pride. And finally, number three, take the lower place and wait for God to exalt you. You remember Jesus' parable of the wedding feast in Luke 14, 7 through 11? He noticed some self-promoting behavior. People were jockeying for seats at this wedding, and Jesus told this parable in which a guest sat himself in one of the best seats at a wedding, only to endure the embarrassment by being asked to go to the back of the room. Better to say, take the back seat and then be invited forward. And Jesus concluded his parable with these words in verse 11. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Proud people are always trying to get ahead. Disciples of Jesus are trying to stay in step. Pride breeds one away, no holds barred ambition, and humility frees us from the rat race, the rat race of endless self-promotion. You can try to claw your way to the top, but unfortunately there's someone right behind you and they're putting their claws in your back. Or you can wait on God and get in step with Jesus because his plan is to exalt you. But his plan is to exalt you not necessarily on your time frame. He will not go and answer all your prayers the moment you first pray them. Even Daniel had to wait several weeks for an answer from God. In that case, it was spiritual warfare. God plans on exalting you in his perfect time. Wait for it. Wait for it. And pray that God will deal with the pride in your life so that you can be humble servant of Jesus. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, on this day in which we've celebrated the Lord's Supper, confession is a big part of that exercise. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to take that same spirit of confession and carry it into this week. Lord, that you would motivate us to go through this 50-question assessment to take stock and inventory of the pride that is squirreled away in our hearts and minds. And I pray, Lord, that we not, would not only recognize the pride, I pray especially that we would not be proud of our pride, but, Lord, that it would drive us to our knees, that we would humbly come before you as your children, confessing that at the end of the day our pride is an offense against heaven. 
You are the only good and perfect one. And Lord, we fall so far short. Lord, if there's somebody here today whose pride has kept them from your cross, whose pride has kept them from humbling themselves and praying for your salvation, I pray, Lord, that you would now, through the power of your Holy Spirit and presence of your Holy Spirit, prompt their heart to join me in this simple prayer. Dear God, I'm a sinner. I've broken your laws. I have violated the conscience that you gave me as a channel marker in life. I have done my own thing. I have lived my own way, and I am far from you. And I've sensed that distance maybe even for a long time, but I've been just way too proud. I want to be the master of my own destiny. I want to call all the shots. I have not been ready to turn over my life, and I've made it a mess. So, Lord Jesus, I want to do differently. I don't want to just try harder. I want to try differently. I want to surrender my life to you, and not just to try, but to do. And so, Lord, I pray that you would take control of my life. I acknowledge that you are the Son of God. I thank you that you went to the cross, that you died for my sins, and I receive that good work that you did on the cross personally, and I ask you, Lord Jesus, to now give to me the gift I don't deserve, the gift of salvation. Thank you for your grace and mercy, Jesus. Amen. Thanks again for listening to this message. We would love to hear from you and learn how God may have challenged you or blessed you as you listen to this message, especially if you feel that you are ready to take your next steps in your walk with Jesus. So contact our church at any time. We would love to hear from you and we look forward to connecting with you. But in the meantime, God bless.